achieved by this musical instrument here. Now, many of you will be familiar with John because he has performed at the symposium many times over the years, usually on a Friday evening, done our music slot and played the harp. And he did last year as well, and it was absolutely enormously good fun. But John is more than a harp player. He's also extremely knowledgeable about the history of the harp and indeed the history of music. And I think the best way to describe his talk today is, um, oh, I can't remember now what I was gonna say. <laughs> What's John doing this morning? It's kind of like the history of sound and music and everything that you would never have even known to have asked. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for yet another Glastonbury resident, Mr. John Dalton. I'll take the floor. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you and good morning. And uh, on this beautiful morning, I shall play some gently awakening music for you. This is, um, as an introduction, it's a piece called the Erd Kuan, the quiet air. And it's one of those pieces that um, is an Irish tune of the class of the fairy music. The Irish harpers, the Celtic harpers, had to play three types of music. The festive music, the music of sadness and partings, and the fairy music. And this was music that was intended to lift the listeners into the to the world, the other world, the world of the elementals, the spiritual world. For the Celtic tradition, like so many, uh, sees us as living in three worlds simultaneously, that of the body, the soul, and the spirit. So. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> now, my talk today is about the music and the evolution of consciousness, because um, it's, I think, well established that music has changed many, very much throughout the ages, and, of course, is very different across the face of the earth. And that the music is connected with the consciousness of the peoples, the folk and the individual composers is, I suppose, undeniable. Um, first of all, we should look at the, perhaps look at the fact that music has always been accorded a very special place amongst the other arts. It's, it has, all the arts are different. Some take place in time, some in space, some involve you know, various materials or the human body. But something separates music from all of the other arts, painting, sculpture, drama, and so forth. And that is the fact that the archetypes of music, these tones, 
are not found in the physical world. You know, the sculptor looks around and sees shapes and forms and creates sculptures. However abstract or, um, or naturalistic, the forms are found in the physical world. Likewise, the painter, you know, the colors that uh, painters use are all to be found pretty much in nature. Even if we use chemicals to create other, you know, chemicals which are colors which aren't found in flowers and rocks and so forth. But with music, the archetypes are not found. And this points to something very special about music, that really it's only human beings who can create music. Some of the animals, the creatures, approach it. And I wouldn't deny also that for a sensitive ear, um, music can be heard in the, the running of streams, in the effects of nature. But let me just take you on a little imaginative journey. Imagine that you're up in the up in the Alps somewhere. It's very misty, you can't see very clearly, and then you hear a very low moaning sound. It's a low indistinct sound. And your first wonder is, is it the wind through the mountains or through a crevice or something like that? You hear that sound. Then you hear it again, that low moaning sound and you wonder whether it might be an animal. Maybe, you know, a, a, one of those alpine cattle in trouble or just lowing. And then you hear the note, the, the tone do this. It jumps up an interval of a fifth. And as soon as you hear that, you realize that you're listening to an alphorn and therefore played by a human being. And what this little example shows is the ancients all believed, that, sorry, not all believed, the ancient sages believed that we live in three worlds of body, soul, and spirit, and that all the sounds that reach our ears come from these three worlds in one way or another. Everything which has a body, everything which is physical, when it can produce sound. Sound is, the, is a, it, the attribute of the physical world. And when we strike something, we can usually tell something about the material from which it's made. That's the, the element of the body. Whether we're hitting metal, glass, stone, wood, or, yes, or, or in the case of the strings, we come to something else. Above, or related to the body, is the fact that the second category is utterance. Whenever we hear someone speaking, singing, we hear animals making their noises, uh, birds singing, we are in the presence of something with a soul. This is how the ancients saw it, that utterance is the presence of the soul expressing itself. And thirdly, there is tone. Now this is not found in the physical world, only created by people. And this was seen as a spiritual phenomenon. This, the relationship of these notes, in this case two to three, or in the case of an octave, two to one, is something that we human beings have, since time immemorial, created in the world. And it was believed that the angels also, for those that could perceive them, created beautiful music. It was the music of the spheres. That reflected itself in the earthly domain. And that this harmony that we find, I hope, pleasurable, is the foundation of the world in which we live. For we are all musical instruments. I always say that to pupils, you know, you are the instrument. The instrument you're really learning to use is, of course, your hands. Not just those, it's head, heart, and hands. And the instrument is a sort of ancillary to that. And we are the instruments. 
and the music that we create reflects much about us as people, as peoples in terms of folk music, as, as peoples in terms of music of particular eras, whether we're talking rock and roll or baroque. It reflects something of the time, of the consciousness. In the earliest days of which we've got real records, music was considered an extremely spiritual phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> you may not know that the, the Gregorian brothers, that the brothers in the, the monasteries in the first, say, five, six hundred years of our era, um, used to sing a verse before they, before they began to sing. They would sing a verse which, which translated is, in order that thy servants may sing with liberated vocal cords, pardon the offenses of the lips which have become earthly. The verse is, ut reant laxis resonare fibris mira gestorum familia tuorum solve pollute labiae reatum sancto Ioannis. The last line is Saint John. And the first word of each line is ut, re, mi, fa, so, la, si. In France, they still talk about ut, re, mi, fa, so we now say do, re, mi, and we've changed the si to a t. But that's the origin of do, re, mi. It's got nothing to do with deers. It's got nothing to do with sewing thread. <laughs> no, it's a prayer which, re which includes the knowledge that since human beings fell into the physical world and learned to speak, um, our connection with the divine was weakened. The brothers in those monasteries sang in order to ascend once again to the spiritual world. And their music was intended to be as pure as possible so that they could, as it were, bask in the divine once again from their fall into the earth. And it was seen that in order to express spiritual things, singing was necessary. The, the spoken word was not really adequate. I'm very fond of the saying, um, song before speech, flutes before blowpipes, and harps before bows. This is the, the opposite of the Darwinian theory, which, which many uh, believe, but no, I think the instruments, the singing, that was the world before these other attributes or you know, facilities were discovered, you know, to be able to use the stretched string as an arrow. Now, another interesting way of looking at music. I'm going to tell you about music in the way of a fairy tale today. So you can just hear it as a story. Have a think about have a think about this, that if there is the music of the spheres and it, ter it sort of terminates in the physical world because everything that is physical has a note in it. Tones are, as it were, buried in everything that's material. We can, we can extract it by striking them or rubbing them or whatever. And our language too contains tones. We can't get away from music we, we, wherever we go. You know, the, uh, the consonants in our language are like musical instruments that we play as we speak and as we sing. Um, as an example, you know, a p, a p, a p will always sound a higher note than a b. And a t, a t will always sound higher than a d. And an s will always be higher than a z, a z. These that there's pitches in everything and in every physical material. But in the case of the spiritual tones I was telling you about, something has to happen. In order to create music, we need to take something material from the world and separate it from the earth a little bit. We can't separate it entirely, but we separate it substantially. 
Do you know the experiment in which uh, Foucault hung his pendulum in the uh, Trianon in Paris? And they swung it across that room. It sw swung across. And over the course of 24 hours, that pendulum performed an arc around the room and came back to where it started um, 24 hours later. In fact, about 27, given some of the, the physical factors. So the pendulum was given an earthly movement by those that swung it back and forth. And then, unexpectedly perhaps for some, it started to have another movement, which was that it moved around the room and gradually returned to where it started a day later. In other words, it orientated itself to something else. It had a super movement. Yes, a super movement one on top of the one that was given to it in the physical world. And that, it orientated itself to the universe, to the our passage around the sun. Now, imagine when we separate the material of the strings, or even the drum skin, or the, the, uh, the reed in the wind instrument, the reeds, when we separate it sufficiently from the earth and cause it to vibrate, it vibrates, as we know, so many cycles a second. But something else, I think, comes into it. It, again, like Foucault's pendulum, something from the universe comes through it. Tone cannot be really expressed merely as so many cycles, vibrations a second. Something else comes through the tones. I played once with a, um, a harper from, from Africa who played the kora. That's that gourd-like instrument with a tall stem and the strings which they play, usually very, very rhythmically. And he explained to me that for them, the tunes don't really have a beginning and an end. They hear the music. It's going on all the time. They use their instrument to manifest it. They bring it into manifestation. They play for as long as they feel like and then they let it go. But the music carries on, it's always there. They, don't, they haven't separated it from the universe, as perhaps we do, where we think, I've got this new tune, I've just heard this new piece by so-and-so. You know, it's his, it's a great tune. It seems more separated then. They, they don't have the same possession of songs in the African Kora um, world. And it's uh, perhaps similar in the Aboriginal music in, um, in Australia, where they hear it as music of the earth, which they conjure up. It's there in the song lines, and they let it go. And I think that that consciousness of the music that is around us, that we manifest, is there's a lot of truth to that. You know, I like this example that, you know, if you have a kettle on the stove, and you, the old-fashioned type, you boil it up, and after a while it starts to hiss. And then it starts to spin. And it starts to whistle. So by lifting the vibration of the kettle, in this case via heat, you know, this instrument becomes a musical instrument for a while, and musical note, can appear through the kettle. Well, you know, the, the harp is a bit more than a kettle, but it is also physical materials lifted up into such a way that music can manifest through it. You know, I'm of the opinion that the, the works of art and the instruments of art are portals through which music can manifest. Just as when we look at a picture, the, the um, the materials dissolve and we enter into the world that the painter has created. So with a musical instrument, it's a, it's a portal through which many types of music can play, can, can appear. And in fact, I'll play you another piece now while you ponder that. The, the, um, 
I, I, I'm of the opinion that instruments are related to the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. You know, wind instruments are the flutes. The fire instruments are those that have that friction, that fricative quality. Um, the earth is clearly the percussion where you hear the materials above all. And the harp is seen as... Um, water instrument. This is the Aaron Boat song. So in the monasteries, the music was seen as an emanation from the spiritual worlds. And in the beginning, they sang plain song. There's no reference to part singing, more than one note, for a long time, for at least 600 years, although it may have existed before then. The melody was everything. And the melody in plain song was, as it were, not made overly beautiful, because m music was also seen as possibly a place where the devil could ensnare people if the music was so beautiful. Saint Augustine worried that if music became too wonderful, it would take the brothers' minds off the divine and they would instead enjoy the music. Anyway, his worries, his worries were were uh, justified because within, you know, four or five hundred years, from a single melody line, music was being written with sometimes 30 parts by Palestrina and others. Music of incredible vocal complexity and beauty. And the way harmony evolved was First of all, we had the single line, and people sang in unison. But then, the octaves. This was called magadizing in Greek, singing in octaves. It started to fill it out. And then came the appreciation of fourths and fifths. brothers would sing this music with as little of their personal inflection as possible. Everything that was important was in the words and being in the divine presence through music. And the music had these intervals which may sound, I don't know, fairly austere perhaps. But one thing, human feeling in a way is absent from this. Do you see it as something outside of us? If I sing, you know, 
There's not much human feeling in that, is there? But if I go, uh, I love you, baby. Can't live without you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got me going out of my mind. That's because. Hey, I think we need some more of this. So it all depends. The harmonies that I'm playing here are all based on thirds. And I'm emphasizing the rhythm. Because we come here to the, these thirds. Thirds is major and minor. Major and minor created, created he them. These relate to the male and the female, to the hot and the cold, to the active and the passive. You hear the difference? Here is the major third. Minor. One is generally seen as optimistic, um, ascending, strong, confident, and the other is more passive, inward, retiring. We can, I don't want to create any sort of stereotypes here, but the active outgoing is seen as the more masculine and the more inward feeling minor third is seen as more feminine. Um, one is ascending confidently, the other, the minor scale, tends to want to descend. Now in the music I just played you, in the first piece, this one, there's not much rhythm. It, the rhythm of the, the, the length of notes was determined by the words in the Gregorian plain chant. The other music has got a strong rhythm that gets you to move. And the music is like this. The melody lines relate to the thoughts that we have. The, the melody is something we think. The, 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 the harmonies, which is just the chords. This is not a tune as such, is it? It's just... These are feelings in the, in the harmonies. Three things fit together, melody, harmony, and rhythm, in the same way that in us, our thoughts are connected with our feelings, and our feelings with our will. If you think about it, if you just had, if I was up here with a bunch of djembe drummers, really filling this hall with sound with drums, you would either rush off because it's too early on a Sunday morning, or, or start to move your limbs. Yes. It would just be a physical thing. If I was to play just harmonies of this sort, you'd probably fall asleep. Your feelings would start to take over, you'd relax. If I played you a tune, A 
course, that's got quite a lot of rhythm to it. And you'd be following that melody. You're, you'd be compelled to sort of pursue it and see where it leads as a line of thought, whether it makes sense or not. So music reflects human beings in the way that the rhythms are part of our rhythmical system. The harmonies are our feelings expressed, and then the tune is, is the, the line of thought. And music has, has been used in recent centuries quite consciously to work upon different aspects of human beings. For example, military music has a strong rhythmical marching pace, usually, if it's to make the men march. It doesn't have much in the way of harmony. It has a strong but simple melody, one that doesn't actually conjure up feelings very much. It has a real good, it has a purpose to get people to march. I, there are working songs, folk working songs, which also have these qualities, but um, the feelings can be more enjoyed in working songs. In military music, such as you, the obvious one is da dum, da 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 dum dum dum, da dum. Da, 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 dum, dum, dum. It's not much of a tune, is it, really? It's the march, it's the drums, that's everything to, that's important there. Um, it gets people marching and feeling strong and empowered, if, if you're a military frame of mind. Um, if one was to play soft strings, you know, Mantovani to the, the troops, that they're about... You know, it just wouldn't work, would it? Now, it's my view also that club music, a lot of it, is actually only one step away from military music. It's got a beat that actually increases people's heart speed. Our natural heart speed, on average, is 72 beats a second. A lot of the club music is around 120 beats. Sorry, did, what did I say? Uh, yeah, a second, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, 120 beats a minute. That's it. And so. When we hear music that's fast, our heartbeat increases. You know that they use fairly speedy music in fast food restaurants because through their little cameras, they can see that people chew faster when the music is faster. So they get you in and out quicker. Yes, your chewing speed will be affected. If it's a restaurant where you know the main course is 30 pounds and the soup is eight pounds and your cup of coffee is four, and so on and so on. They'll play really soft, gentle music, so you linger, have another coffee, another brandy, and... Yes, music is manipulation, viewed from a, let's say, a 21st century perspective. But I don't... I mean, that's an ugly word, isn't it? Manipulation. But that's what it definitely has become in some quarters. My view of the evolution of music in the West is that it started off as this, it started off at least in the church realm, all the arts were connected with the church, as an emanation of the divine. And then, um, actually when polyphonal music was banned in the church, the, the uh, composers of that music in the um, 12th century um, had to find work elsewhere and they, found work in, in Civvy Street and created a, a, a whole new range of music outside the church. Later they were allowed back in. Polyphonal music developed, <clears throat> but the idea of the bodily rhythms in the music wasn't really um, a strong feature until the 20th century. And this is connected with the way that um, our, con our conceptions of the human being have changed. You know, I'm, I'm saying that in the beginning we were seen as threefold, spirit, soul, and body. In um, an ecumenical council in Constantinople in the ninth century, the spirit in the human being was considered a heresy. We were soul and body, and 
the soul had some spiritual attributes. It was a heresy to think we were threefold. Otherwise, if we're spirits, what need have we for a church? Why do we need middlemen? So no, God is outside of us. We are soul and body. And we've now come to a century which really has almost abolished the, the soul. We are body with some soul-like aspects. And so the music has evolved too in that from being a purely spiritual phenomenon, it came down to having all those wonderful harmonies um, and polyphonal characteristics and then the introduction of the, of the body consciousness through rhythms, through the, 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 you know, the percussion in the orchestra. And in the 20th century, composers really began to discover the power of, of rhythms. Stravinsky obviously comes to mind. And in the popular musical world, much happened as well. I mean, thanks to the, the slaves you know, being taken to the United States, um, you know, the blues, jazz appeared, and the rhythms there have then come into Western popular music very strongly. Um, the esotericist Cyril Scott, a great composer in his own way, he wrote a book about um, the effects of music um, and consciousness, and he felt in some ways that it was bad that jazz in the 30s, when he wrote his book, was becoming so popular because the strong rhythms of the jazz um, were having an effect. People were becoming more aware of their bodies, and instead of walking around in the straight-laced manner of the 19th century, they were now dancing wildly, cavorting with each other. And uh, this is all to do with the strong rhythms. Um, I'm sure you've seen that yourselves, maybe even indulged once in a while. Um, and yet, this was important because the, the, uh, in order to break away from the straitjackets of convention of the 19th century and so on, imposed largely by the church, this music had to appear. The question is, does the music affect society or society produce the music? This is a big question. I don't know. I'd love to hear some of your opinions afterwards. So the music of the African rhythms came through rock and roll for example, over here, and people danced in a new way. People related to each other in a new way. Now, as to whether music affects society's evolution or music is merely something that um, appears afterwards and reflects it, I'm of the opinion that it does change society. There's a lot of evidence for that. If music, if a tune, if a type of style of music can affect one person, it can affect many. The ancient Chinese empire was very, very much based upon controlling every aspect of human life. <clears throat> and it still is, I suppose. But in those days, thousands of years ago, and when Confucius was alive, it was understood that music musicians should play for the emperor, they should come from various corners of the empire and play for the emperor and his court and have the music assessed. The reason was this, they wanted the music to reflect heaven. If the music reflected heaven, they argued, it would be a stable society. Um, because heaven is eternal, if we play heavenly music, our society will be calm and peaceful like the heavens. And so the Chinese music was m largely based upon five-note scales. They had other divisions, but the five main notes were the important ones. And they related. They related to the five elements of um, earth, air, fire, water, and wood, and also to the five divisions of society which was the emperor, the court, let me just find this, um, the people, they're one category, then I think it was the natural world, and then things, things that we make, five divisions. And for them all to be in harmony, it was important to play music that was also harmonious. Yeah. Um, that's right. 
So various musicians would come, they would come and play for the emperor, and if their music wasn't good, it, they were prohibited from playing it. For example, Confucius, he say, the music of Cheng is lewd and corrupting. The music of Sung is soft and effeminate. The music of Wei is repetitious and annoying. The music of Qi is harsh and makes one haughty. So this is some of his recorded uh, views on some musicians of his day. He was quite a critic. And the, two, the scale that is, you, know, you most often associate with Chinese music is this. Thank you. <clears throat> That's just the five notes. And in the relationship of those five, there can be no darkness. Because, because I say so. <laughs> and it's because, contrast it with this. The, may, the, the intervals are all seconds and thirds. Here, this scale, here's something which couldn't have come from the ancient world, I think. This is the blue scale, and it has the major and minor thirds together. In other words, it's got this mixture of happiness and sadness of tension, of, of ascension and collapsing. And that's a 20th century phenomenon because we know what it is to suffer in this world. We know how it is to have anxieties and so forth. And the music reflects it. Circle blues, they're all in the news, oh yeah. I still don't know the answer, it gives me the blues. And my dog just died, and my girlfriend, she's run off too. You know, that scale has to <laughs> be able to express things like that. That's the blues scale. And it came in in the 20th century. And because our awareness of ourselves changed, composers such as Bach and, uh, and Mozart were conduits for the music of the gods or of God as they saw it. Mo Bach said, you know, music is uh, composing is a conversation with the Almighty. Mozart, who was a very different character, said, I write music as a cow as a sow piddles. 
I write music as a sow piddles. He, he, he just could do it. He was, you know, as the film, the film may not be based on truth, but it shows how Mozart could just do it. He was ridiculously talented, and wherever he wanted, he could write music. He took no interest in nature, no interest in architecture or the other arts, nothing. He just wrote music. Later on, one sees that the composers became more of an individual composer who struggled. Beethoven is the great example in which we can feel the human struggle. And it's my view that the Impressionist composers, they were reaching beyond themselves into the elemental worlds, the worlds of nature, of the plants and so forth. They were again venturing into the spiritual world, but by, into a different area. The music which had been of the gods in the Gregorian time and later has now handed over to man. And because it was handed to us, we can play with it as we will. We can make wonderful music, those of us who can do it, and we can make terrible music. We can make, we can make use of music for evil ends. You know, the Gamuzak Corporation came into existence in 1928. It was a military man, General George Stewart, who set up a company to send piped music into department stores down the telephone lines because he'd worked out that uh, music would affect the way people shopped. They'd find the shop more entertaining, actually, if it had music in it. To begin with, very few shops had music. So they would go to the shop where they could hear music. Um, over the decades, they have worked um, very uh, assiduously to work out the effects of music, types of music. They've got hundreds of categories. So when you go into a place, beware, beware. If it's a fast, if it's a place that sells cheap clothing, they'll play you fast, beaty music. Because you go in, you start to dance, you pick the clothing off the rack, you think, hey, that looks good. You don't check if the buttons are on properly or anything, you just buy it and waltz out of there. <laughs> if you're going to buy a very expensive dress or suit, the music will be very slow and languid because they're going to, they know that if you play beautiful classical music in a place, they can charge 10% more and no one will quibble. <laughs> That's right, if you play bubblegum music, even if it's a good product, you still think, That's expensive. <laughs> it somehow seems cheaper because it's part of the buying experience. They reckon that uh, if they play, have music in a store, you'll spend 20% more time and 18% more money than if there was no music. So beware, beware. And that's only the start of it. Because since World War II, they started to think of how to use music for torture. And uh, it was used you know, in the prisons in Northern Ireland. It was used against General Noriega when they played music for days on end through huge loudspeakers to him, and he gave up. And they've been using it in prisons in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on, and Guantanamo ever since. They call it no-touch torture. The beauty being, there's no pictures of bruises and lacerations. It's just relentless bombardment with music at high volumes for 24 hours non-stop. And guess what? The CIA manual says, you know, it takes 20 days on average to break someone with physical torture, but if you do it with music, three days, two or three days. They even have uh, um, chat rooms on the internet where some of these practitioners discuss the music that they find most effective. This is our descent, you know, that from the music of the spheres to the music of the gods to the beauty of folk music, through the music of machines, which is what rock and roll and a lot of beat music is. It had to come as we fell in love with our machines, our cars, our trains, our planes. Um, the music became mechanized and the gods perhaps forgotten. And then the effects on the body became more and more evident. And so music became used by these diabolical practitioners as a means of hurting people. Because something which can elevate us, lift us into spiritual worlds, can obviously perform wonders of healing. Music therapy was really is about a century old now, um, and yet its effects were known long ago as having healing and beneficial effects. 
but the idea of it as torture is repugnant, and most musicians, um, some musicians whose music has been used have uh, protested and formed a, a society called No DB, um, a movement in, intended to stop this being done. But uh, that's just the darkest side. Oh, oh, the other thing I should mention at this moment is the Americans have developed a thing called the LRAD, which is the Long Range Acoustical Device. This is a thing which can fire rock music for about a half a mile or so at, a, at 150 decibels. Um, and they used it in Fallujah. They fired this weapon at the, uh, the town of Fallujah, several of them. It sends this music at incredible volume, rock music, heavy metal, and it bounces off the walls and completely disorientates people. They cannot, you can't do anything when you're subjected to that kind of volume. And so they see it as an equivalent of smoke screens, smoke bombs, and so on, distractions. That's the dark side which we're at. But of course, at the same time, there is the, the light aspect of music, the, the ever-increasing awareness of how powerful it can be for the good. And uh, I'll play you another tune now. This is a tune that is the oldest song in the book, at least in the West. When I say it's the oldest song in the book, I mean it. It's called the Epitaph of Saikilos. You may know this, you may not. It's, it's the oldest known song written down with the words and with the notes and their durations. It's from a tomb that was found in um, Aden in present-day Turkey. It dates from the first century AD, and it's the epitaph of Saikilos. The inscription on the stone reads, I am a tombstone, an icon, and Saikilos placed me here as an everlasting sign of deathless remembrance. And it's a beautiful stone tablet with these carvings. It's currently in the museum in Copenhagen. And on it is, is a, a tune and some words. The, uh, the tune, I'll play it for you, it's a beautiful one. And this is from a time when harmonies didn't exist, as we, as, as we think. translated is, as long as you live, be light-hearted, shine, let nothing trouble you. Life is only too short and time takes its toll. That's the Greek, that's the text. In the last line you'll hear the word chronos. I think that's a very beautiful tune from antiquity, which is easily harmonized today, and with a sentiment and a feeling that is really across the ages. Now, the other thing I'd like to add about music is, 
music is not exactly what we hear. We think of music as coming across the vibrating air, whether from the harp or the loudspeakers. But it's more than that. Um, music is something we hear through the ear, but we experience it in our whole bodies. We hear different instruments, different sounds in different parts of us. A good example, in a way, is the scraping of the fingers on the blackboard or the scraping of the saucepan. When we hear that, we normally hunch up or hold our skin. We feel something doing something to our skin. When we hear bass drums or a bass, a double bass, you know, it affects the lower part of us usually. When we hear a string section, think of Mantovani again, it's like being stroked. On, the, on another level from the physical, from those vibrating air molecules, we're being affected by the music as a sort of entity working within us. We can reject it, of course, but it's there. It enters into us. Because music is, so, is different from the other arts in that it doesn't require a mental image to be created and we cannot find the archetypes in nature, when we play musical notes, we are, are bringing out into manifestation something which is at a deeper level than the external physical things that artists can use. Um, Schopenhauer expressed it as the will of nature. We're playing with the heartbeat of nature that lies behind the manifestations. And it's because of that that music can affect people, whether they're babies, teenagers, middle age, old age, or musicologists. It can affect anyone, regardless also of their culture. Um, it may not affect them all identically, but that's because of our individual evolution, our individual natures. The music we particularly love will probably reflect something of our composition in the way that of our melodies, in our thoughts, our harmonies, the feelings we enjoy, and the rhythms, you know? Um, it's an interesting case. I remember I, I stayed at a nunnery one time in Somerset, and um, I played a bit of harp for the sisters one night. But one of them came up to me and said uh, beforehand, she said, I'd like you to know that I, I won't be coming to the performance tonight. I don't like the way music affects my emotions. And she was quite a young uh, nun. Most of them were old ladies, actually, but uh, there were a couple of young ones. And uh, one of them wouldn't even come to my performance, let alone anywhere else. And so music is manipulative, and she knew it. And she didn't want her feelings tampered with. Um, think about the, ke the, the people who like to roll around the streets in their cars with those sound systems. Boom, chicka boom, chicka boom, chicka boom, chicka boom. Really loud. You know, that's a kind of empowering sound for them. It really is powerful. Um, it's their mother's heartbeat, in my view, translated into their womb-like cars. <laughs> and in the, in the same way, you know, that the, 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 the kids that really like the death metal, this is incredibly aggressive rock. It doesn't have much of a tune. It's mostly screaming, very loud, thrashing guitars. It's a kind of empowering music for people who are actually very insecure. Um, it is. It doesn't, their feelings are not touched. It's really powerful beat. It's akin to military music. It affects their consciousness. Up in Henbury in Bristol, there's an area where there's a row of shops that was getting drive, you know, s trucks smashing through the windows. They put up bollards, they put up the, the shutters, and they still have the kids. So they put armor-plated loudspeakers playing Mozart in front of the shops at night, and the kids disappeared. <laughs> They did, because this music would touch parts of them that they, they're not ready to have awakened. They, they couldn't handle it. They had to go somewhere else. This is music therapy. <laughs> 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 um, 
So I see it as a, as a, it's a, it's spiritual. It's a spiritual phenomenon. And you know why the harp is the instrument of the angels? You remember I said earlier, you've got sound, which is from physical matter. You've got utterance from the soul, and you've got, you've got. Okay, one minute. Just, the, it's this. Um, the harp is a physical instrument, sure, but you don't hear much of the wood of the harp, you know, because it doesn't matter whether it's made of mahogany or maple, they pretty much, they don't sound that different. The strings are in the open air, so you hear a pure string, a string sound, and it's very little physical material in the string. You can't do vibrato, so I can't make it sing that, you know, you hear instead the pure tones. It, and the harp has to be in tune. An out of tune harp is dreadful. But if you're a jazz singer with a sax, you can play out of tune, it sounds great. Or a blues singer, blue notes are like that. And if, I get, if I sing out of tune, you know it's okay, baby. It don't matter if I'm all over the place, if I'm Van Morrison. You know, because the feeling is so strong, I can sing out of tune. But the harp wants you to be in tune. And it's between those notes that the real music occurs. What you hear in the physical world is pleasing to our ears, but what moves us is the movements between the notes. That is it, the movement. Arthur Schnabel, the pianist, said, in terms of playing notes, I'm just a good pianist, but it's the pauses, and it's the, it's the pauses and the movements between notes. That is where the artistry lies. So I think that is where I must stop, and if anybody has questions... <laughs> on that pregnant pause, and I thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. Ladies and gentlemen, John Dalton. <laughs> thank you, John, absolutely super.